Okay, well, welcome everybody to the September 23rd meeting of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics. Uh, today, we are going to try a slightly shorter format. We're going to have a joint talk by uh, two speakers from our group from Mexico, uh, and then have the discussion within the one hour. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I need to remind everybody that the meeting is live streamed and recorded and will be distributed. As always, if you have any ideas, complaints, suggestions, you can reach me and Reinhardt at the usual email addresses. Any questions about the web administration, the IMAG MSM the website for the working group, please talk to Jim Sluka. Uh, suggestions, especially for speakers, please uh, talk to Bruce uh, Shapiro, you have our email addresses. We're always happy to hear from people with ideas. Uh, we have our various uh, links. I've been posting the announcements for these meetings on LinkedIn. Uh, there is a LinkedIn channel for the IMAG MSM working groups, which we could use. We have our YouTube channel and, of course, the IMAG MSM wiki page. Are there any announcements? I guess, Reed, you had some things you wanted to talk about. So why don't you uh, sure. let us know. Yeah, so I, I've got some, some updates. I um, wish they were a little more concrete, but the bottom line is, is there has been some talk over the summer about an IMAG meeting that would be hosted by the Viral Pandemic Working Group, if I get those details correct. And the, I think the good news is, is that there is a lot of interest in having a meeting. Um, when we went back to the, the IMAG contingency, so all the different government agencies beyond NIH, um, there seems to be agreement that there's interest in the digital twins concept. However, digital twins in the context of infectious diseases is not that as appealing to like the Department of Energy, for example, right? And so we've been meeting, we met with, uh, had a few meetings and Grace Pang and I have been trying to get everybody on board um, for what a meeting would look like that would be inclusive and incorporate interests from these different agencies that include digital, tw digital twins. Um, so for example, we had a call with uh, DARPA this morning, um, some DARPA folks this morning to sort of see what their interests are um, and trying to push this a little bit to then follow up with this group in terms of how we could contribute to that meeting. So I keep I keep promoting my interest in infectious diseases being an IAD that I'm interested in this in the context of infectious diseases and pandemics. And so, you know, that I, I want that to be represented. Um, but also realize that now that it's sort of more of a broader um, interest um, with, with these other groups, we sort of have to try to figure out a way to make it work for all. So my, my hope is to follow up about that soon. The other thing I will say, is there is interest potentially in a multi-scale modeling of viral pandemics, specifically in NIAD. Um, that might, but that would be more likely in the out years of fiscal year 2022. So we'd be talking about, um, you know, maybe like next summer or next fall, something like that. Um, that would be in line with, you know, I think I can't really say much right now because I don't know a lot, but there, there's um, pandemic preparedness um, funding that, you know, is very broad. It's been in the news, I think. And, you know, trying to figure out um, where multi-scale modeling fits into that broader context is, is something that we've had ongoing conversations about. Um, that's not talking about specific funding. That's not guaranteeing any type of funding. That's just saying that, you know, the, the concept of multi-scale modeling should be on the conversation for, for pandemic preparedness. Um, so I, I just want to say those are kind of the two things on my radar. And I'll stop talking. Sorry to say that again, James. Did you have anything else you needed to say? No, it was just about the survey. John, John covered it. And check the chat for the link if you need it. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Let's hope we're not bombed again. I, that's, as I say, a unique experience. I apologize to our speakers for that. Uh, I guess that's the, those are the, the vicissitudes of modern life. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, for next week, we have uh, Kai Mingyi from uh, Binghamton University talking about vaccine development. Uh, we have uh, 
for the first time since we began the workshop working group um, some open slots so if anybody would like to speak up for october 7th and october 14th uh, we really would appreciate your suggestions uh, we can have a discussion people who have presented before are welcome to present either updates on their work or new material uh, so please uh, do help us uh, fill the schedule. Uh, October 21st, we do have two speakers lined up. Uh, and uh, into November, we also have speakers lined up. But for the, uh, the first two weeks of October, we don't have anybody booked at the moment. Uh, working group leaders uh, are welcome. Uh, we could have a discussion, open discussion of the future of the working group. I know we tried that uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, but maybe people have had more time to think about it. Uh, we could talk about the organization of the uh, potential uh, meetings, uh, anything that people would like. So if people have ideas how to use that time uh, together, we'd very much appreciate it. Um, we can certainly cancel the meetings if we need to, but uh, uh, it's nice to be together. So ideas would be appreciated. Okay, so without... Further ado, uh, we will move on to the talk uh, on uh, models and indicators for evolution of epidemic in Mexico. I know Mexico has had a very different uh, course of the epidemic from other countries, so I'm looking forward to hearing the talk. Please take. Okay, I'm going to share the, the screen and start. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a uh, it's good to talk to you, to, to share with you our work. And this work is a relatively simple idea. Mexico has, as uh, James said, a different epidemic, but not only in terms of uh, the, prop the population dynamics aspects of it, but also in terms of how has been controlled or mitigated or managed. And uh, without going to the politics of it, which is a hot topic here in Mexico as anywhere else, I think, uh, the main thing is that the mitigation uh, of, uh, uh, of the epidemic in Mexico has been uh, limited because we, uh, the policy here was not to have extensive testing. We don't have uh, contact tracing. And now with the, um, um, the, the rise of the different variants of concerns, particularly Delta, we have limited uh, sequencing of um, of, 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 of the different variants that we have. So we have a serious uh, uh, default on data. We need more data and still we need to, to, to fight the epidemic and we need to control it and we need to know the fate, the, the, the evolution of the epidemic. And in this idea is that we've been developing models in order to supply or substitute in, a, in the, as, as much as it can be substituted uh, using mathematical models to inform public uh, health officials. We are working closely with the state of, uh, of Querétaro in central Mexico. For a moment, we were involved with Mexico City and with the Sonora State in which Adrián, the other speaker is, uh, is from. So without more uh, introduction, let me give you, this is a very simple thing is the idea is to develop information, to provide information for decision-making in terms of the pandemic at the population level. And one of the things that uh, we detected is something that probably sounds obvious is that history matters in our SARS-CoV-2 dynamics in the following sense. Mexico is a country in which uh, we have a lot of uh, civic and religious uh, events. And those civic and religious events create what we call in Spanish puentes, which means bridges. That means that uh, holiday may be on Thursday and then the weekend, and then you take for you say Friday, and then you have a long weekend from uh, Thursday to Friday, for example. And all these things have altered the effective contact rate. Uh, because we have already one more than a year of history on the epidemics, we are able to estimate the contact rate using mathematical models, as I will show you later. But also we are aware of the key calendar events that took place in 2020. And that according to the data we have in cases, mortality, uh, some positivity of the, uh, the tests in Mexico are, are done 
especially when the people go to the hospital, but we still have some testing and uh, we can recreate the scenarios of the evolution of the epidemic using the information that we have last year around these key calendar events with heightened transmission. So that's one thing. The other is that the social behavior, the civic behavior, the religious holidays are the dates occurring dates that are known well in advance of when they happen. And we know the people is going to gather and to generate uh, super dispersion events. These are essentially has been characterized as super dispersion events. And we are going to try to use that information in terms of the percentage change observed in the contact rate last year to bring that together, put it into the projections of this year and to try to uh, evaluate the fate of the epidemic. As I said before, we have a lack of in intensive widespread testing and also the mitigation and enf enforcing of mitigation was very much. We never had a truly uh, true lockdown. Social distancing is difficult to follow because of more than half of the population in Mexico have informal and a foreign economy, they don't pay taxes, they are not registered, and they live day by day. So these are the problems we have in Mexico, and we develop models to try to solve this problem or help to solve it. These, these assumptions are, as are listed there, each state in Mexico, we run the model for every state. Each state is an independent epidemic. We don't do a metapopulation or anything like that. We postulate that the effective contact rate is that one that captures the local behavior and of the interactions in that states. We do not consider new viral strain variants, although we can observe the effect of the variants on the projections we provide. And uh, we only do the update and the projections for 15 days. The most we have managed is one month. We can do more, but obviously, as you know, uh, those projections are very, very controversial. Those uh, are not... Uh, uncertain, more than uncontroversial, very uncertain. So in Mexico, this, these are the most important dates at the national level. Each state have their own uh, civic religious uh, activities for the patron saint of the state, of the town, or see this holiday, this civic uh, uh, re reunion and things like that. But we have uh, Children's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Independence Day, Day of the Dead, the Black Friday, which here is called Buen Fin, the day of the Guadalupe Virgin, Christmas, New Eve, these are more or less international, but then we have Wise Main Day where the children receive presents, Valentine's Day, Benito Juarez Day, which is one of the greatest heroes here in Mexico, Easter, and then it repeats itself. So we are going to essentially look at the uh, effective transmission date, and we are going to look how it changes from date to date, but only taking into uh, account these dates, these key, that's what we call key calendar dates. So which, uh, without more, uh, 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 let me see, I cannot change the thing, what happened? Uh, this, the, the next slide will be uh, described by my colleague, Adrián uh, Acuña Segarra from the University of Sonora. Adrián, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thanks for him. Uh, well, um, um, now I'm going to talk about the mathematical model formulation. Um, <clears throat> as a first approach, we propose an extension of a Kerman McKendry model with eight ordinary differential equations. Thus, um, in addition of susceptible and recovery classes, the model considered an exposed class and three classes of infected individuals, uh, that is, asymptomatic, uh, symptomatic, and reported. Once this is reported, we follow Mexican health policies. Uh, we consider that infected individuals are effectively isolated and are no longer participants in the process, in the transmission process. Uh, the three infected classes we previously mentioned, uh, that is uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic, and reported, can recover, but uh, we assume that only reported individuals can die. Uh, uh, this, slide, this last is based under an ideal case that is uh, in which all severe cases are reported. Um, 
We also consider it a vaccination process. Uh, that's only individual, uh, pardon, that's only susceptible individual can be vaccinated with an effective vaccination rate. In the same way, uh, both vaccinated and reported individuals will eventually return to the susceptible state after a certain, possibly different immunity period. Okay. On the other hand, uh, vital dynamics are also included since an objective, one objective is to produce midterm scenarios for the pandemic. Uh, sorry, now uh, please for uh, the previous slide. Okay. Thanks. Uh, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, we can observe the basic reproduction number, uh, which is calculated by next generation matrix method. Uh, here uh, we can observe contribution of asymptomatic and symptomatic infected people on the disease transmission dynamics. Okay, uh, the next please. Okay. Uh, mm, it's uh, highly important to stress that the transmission contact rate is uh, for us a uh, time-dependent function. Um, this function is defined by a piecewise uh, polynomial, uh, interpolated polynomial. Uh, to build this polynomial, we set some points at different times, which were estimated later. Um, we emphasize that instead of choosing these times equally spaced along the observation period, they are located at predetermined calendar dates and, or key dates or, uh, key, uh, or key dates associated to super speed events, uh, government intervention or other events that could affect the evolution of the pandemic of the epidemic curve. On the left, the figure shows a diagram of the structure of this rate as good as can you see here. Uh, to estimate the different points of the transmission contact rates, we use a data of federal national records from daily report case and deaths and a Bayesian inference framework. Uh, it's important to mention that for estimation process, uh, we employed the mathematical model without vaccination. The complete model is used to project different scenarios. It is also important to note that the first key date is not the same for each Mexican state. For example, in Mexico City, the pandemic starts on February 20th, while in Querétaro, it starts on March 5th. And the following key dates are the same for each Mexican state. And on the right, the figure short the point wise posterior median estimate of transmission contact rate for several states in Mexico. It's important to stress that uh, also each place has a different curve. There are nonetheless common patterns. As is shown here, the rate remains low between uh, approximately uh, June 2020 and September 2020. And the effect of the winter holidays is clear in each state. Moreover, it is interesting that a few states show an increase in the contact rate after the start of the mitigation measures, and that is uh, March 23, such as Querétaro, Guanajuato, and Campeche, for example. Uh, uh, the next, please. Okay. Uh, this is your for her on me. Well, as you like, you want to do it? Uh, uh, you please. Okay. Well, with this uh, framework, we this is an example of the projections that we have. This is the epidemic in Mexico City. The red line is the median of the model estimated, uh, the uh, usual uh, confidence limits. And uh, in blue is the data that we use for the estimation and in black, are is the data that we use for projection. And the color codes, this is simple an amplification of this part. The color codes indicates the red, the more red, the redder the area is the area in which the model predicts the epidemic to behave if 
it were, were following the same changes in the contact rate that last year at the same time of the year, those same months. So uh, as you can see, this, this uh, was done cutting the date until May 10th. And then we did the projection. The projection is rather good. The data behaves more or less as the projection. This indicates that the people in Mexico City, one interpretation, they were behaving very much like at the same time but the last year. However, uh, we computed the same, same model, but now using data until uh, the, mid the middle of June. And then uh, the, or again, the more the redder the area uh, is the area in which the, the projection uh, says uh, the population should, the, the epidemic should behave if the same behavior reflected by the contact rate uh, last year was you've been uh, followed now. However, by June, uh, middle of June, as you can see, this does not work. Uh, but this time the Delta variant was already in Mexico City. And as you can see, although we cannot for sure assign that this growth rate to that variant, it is, it is nevertheless a circumstantial evidence that it was there. And you can see that the projection then uh, of the model is not uh, anymore related to the more likely behavior of the epidemic even last year, but it indicates that the contact rate has uh, gone up compared to that uh, baseline standard. And now the projection of the epidemic uh, and the data fit uh, areas in which we are having a higher contact rate than before. This is for as an example, uh, uh, Adrian will tell you of the latest update on the model and some modifications we did, we did to it. So uh, go ahead, yeah. Adrian. Okay, well, um, um, to extend our base model, uh, we consider that the vaccination class can be infected with a certain efficacy uh, and that the proportion of reported people who got recovered is a time dependent function. Now, for this new model, we also estimate the proportion of recovered people <clears throat> who got recovered. Uh, to do this, uh, we follow it the same ideas of those used to estimate the transmission contact rate. So we use a specific date to estimate some points. And with this, we build a piecewise cubic hermit interpolating polynomial. Uh, in this case, key dates uh, were the same as those used to estimate the transmission contact rates. Another notable difference with the previous version is that the estimation process used that complete model. That is, now we use vaccination states. Okay. Uh, our, our objective uh, with this model version is to generate other projection of two weeks and therefore to build some epidemiolo epidemiological indexes. Uh, for example, uh, the effective reproduction number or uh, risk index. Clearly, parameters values will est uh, estimated will be unknown for this period. Uh, for example, uh, we use uh, data until uh, September 15th, middle of September, and two weeks after, we know the value of these parameters, okay? For this reason, we set two hypotheses regarding unknown parameters value. The first one is that the transmission contact rate value unknown followed the behavior of the previous year. And the second one is that the proportion unknown of the reported people who got recovered took the value of the last estimate value of this parameter. Okay, uh, next please. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, an example. No? Here we can observe uh, COVID-19 disease dynamics for Mexico City with a last, uh, last uh, model. And the figure show in the upper row, deaths, reported case, and total infections. While in the lower row, it is observed the cumulative total COVID-19 infection, the effective reproduction number, and the risk index. And this projection was simulated until October 1st. And the reported data was considered until September 15th. Um, for the upper uh, row, uh, the red solid line represents the median 
of the solution for each day. While dashed black lines illustrate the 95% confidence interval. Blue bars represent the data used for estimation, while the green bars represent the available data. And uh, how Jorge said, uh, for this projection, uh, the darker area represents the higher probability of occurrence. Okay, so in this way, our projection suggests that uh, for Mexico City, there will no regrowth anytime soon uh, until uh, October first. No, uh, next please. Okay, um, now uh, we can observe COVID nineteen dynamic for Creta. Uh, clearly, Cretalo shows different epidemic curve than Mexico City. Uh, uh, for Mexico City, uh, there is a plateau, uh, the first step of the epidemic. Uh, however, for both the scenarios, show similar behavior for their effective reproduction number. For example, it's clear the effect on the winter holiday in both states uh, between uh, in that, that uh, December and includes uh, Black Fridays that's at November. Uh, regarding projected scenarios, unlike the previous case, uh, that is for Mexico City, Querétaro shows slower decay in the epidemic curve. And the first uh, figure on the second in the first row, no? Um, another difference than Mexico City scenario is observed in the risk index. Here, we observe that for October 1st, these values remains over 50%. Here in this figure, a uh, yellow line represents uh, the risk of uh, found an, one infected people, okay, in a capacity of uh, 50 people. Uh, orange is the 100 people and red is 200 people. Uh, okay, but Jorge? And just to end, to finish the talk, the risk index is essentially the, the, the index that uh, Joshua Weitz developed, this uh, probability of finding a person in a group, infected person in a group of K, K, uh, K persons. And we adopted that. Uh, that index depends on the, active case, the, the proportion of active cases in the, in the population. Since we, do, since we do not have a zero prevalence data, the latest uh, uh, information on that and a national level here in Mexico dates from August last year. So we don't have any updated uh, base uh, database on that. We use the estimations of the model to compute the, the total true number of cases. And then we apply the methodology of Joshua Bites and we form these heat maps. And these are being used in Mexico to, for example, guide our um, reopening of schools because they are, they are indicators of risk at a municipal county in the United States terminology or state level. We use two models. This is based on the model we just showed you. We do use a more robust model, tested model that can go deeper, a lower scale, like county municipal data, which is the COVID steam model that developed at Yale, Harvard, and Stanford, I believe. And that is, uh, that is not a comportamental model that is more based on what data you have and what you want to infer about the things that you don't observe. But we use both and this is the data we have and the things we are using. And with this, I think we just thank our, our collaborators. There are a group of awesome statisticians, mathematicians, biologists, students, of course, that are the ones that compute all the indices and the sponsors, especially the state of Querétaro, the, Dirección General de Epidemiología, the federal government, the Coordinación Investigación Científica, the universities we, belong, we uh, depend on, and the uh, National University for the Computing and Financial Resources. And that's all. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please. Questions? Dan Adams here from DARPA. I was curious about the um, the model description you put up there. In particular, when you factored in vaccination, it looked like um, 
looked like vaccination then transitioned into exposed. Uh, but it seems like some of the downstream, you, you, it, it seems odd to me to have susceptible and vaccinated at the same level collapsing into exposed without maintaining that distinction. Um, I'm well, thinking about the probability of becoming symptomatic as a function of vaccination differs. Right. Well, in the model, it, I think you refer to this to this slide, right? Yes. Yeah. As you see, the vaccination, uh, the vaccinated people uh, do not uh, pass to the exposed class. Let me minimize something. So they, they, uh, probably that's something that we should look at. You are correct, because in this case, we assume that the vaccination people once is infected because the efficacy of the vaccine is low, they go to the infected class without passing through the uh, exposed population. That's one, that's one hypothesis. So we don't distinguish, that, that's why we don't distinguish in the exposed class if they come from vaccination or susceptible, because we do this, this assumption on the, on the on the I, I see. So the, the assumption is the yeah. vaccination is either 100% yeah, or think, 0%. Yeah, and I think the, the, the problem here is the, the diagram, right? That has a, a no, 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 I'm, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Yes, we have transmission. Yeah. Sorry, I hadn't seen this. Sorry, I was thinking in the previous model. No, yes, this is, uh, we, do, we do have vaccination going into exposed class. So you are suggesting we should, we should differentiate because exposed coming from a natural infection and exposed coming from vaccination uh, events, right? Okay, yeah. Based on what I read, maybe, although frankly, I'm not at all sure it would affect your outcome given the just limitations of the model and the data, I just wanted to understand. Okay, yes, we, are, we, 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 we should look at it. Thank you very much, yes. Sorry for my confusion before, yes. Adrian, I don't know if you want to say something about it. Well, uh, uh, for this model, we consider it uh, that vaccinated people uh, can be infected with uh, certain efficacy. Okay, but uh, for uh, the assumption for us is that people that is vaccinated, that's uh, same to susceptible people when the vaccine is not efficacy for us. For you, for you please. Sorry. Uh, Mm, that's all for, for me. Other questions? Yes. I, I have a question if other people aren't going to jump in, which is I know undercounting, if you're not testing a lot, undercounting, of course, is a problem. Right. Uh, but the undercounting isn't static. The, the degree of undercounting can change in time. How, is that something that you you think you can see in your data or is that is fundamentally you're assuming the level of undercounting is more or less constant in time? Well, the, the, what we are use here is the following, the, it's a reasoning more than a, anything because we know by fact that the subreporting in Mexico is large. We essentially, uh, uh, the reported of cases, especially the last year, was done of the people that got to the hospital and or, or a health center and was diagnosed and was uh, recorded. But many, many, many people did not go to the hospitals. They it did not go tested, so it's not reported. Our, um, our excess deaths in Mexico, some estimates go to uh, about half a million uh, uh, deaths along the epidemic. Although the data recorded by the health authorities based on cases that they reported is less than 250,000 or something like that. So how, we have a huge problem with the report. So to, to, to prevent this problem we is that we use this statistical model, the COVID STEAM. This model is based on the different uh, probability distributions of transitions of the different stages of the disease, uh, uh, delays in reported cases uh, and things like that. Some of these uh, uh, pro uh, distributions we can compute from the data in Mexico. Others, we have to use those uh, 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 calculated or estimated in other countries. And with that, we project the total cases 
and uh, wait is hoping because we don't have a proof of that. We don't. Have, we don't have a way of testing that we are doing a good job in solving the problem of subreporting. Using the total uh, the total number of cases using these probability distributions, we assume that we have a better estimate of the total number of cases, even under under reporting. And uh, these estimates co coincide with many of the estimates that are done in a very um, how can I say. Uh, empirical or heuristic way if I, by the epidemiologists and, uh, and hospitals and, uh, and, and the dependencies that we have in Mexico about the to true no total number of cases. And uh, given that they are more or less in, in the same range, we use this estimation. We do the same with this model. We uh, use the, that to estimate the total number. We have confidence bands, the uncertainty in many estimations is large, but this is what we use. So we have a deficiency there, yes. And we don't have a way to fix it. Other questions? I, I have one more people aren't going to ask. So you have a duration of resistance, which is one over omega here. Although I think the equation and the uh, the equation and the uh, diagram don't quite correspond. So, uh, and so what is the what is the, your estimate? Maybe you spoke or talked about this, but when you run your model, what mm -hmm. do you get as your uh, estimated uh, duration of resistance? How long uh, does your 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 how long typically when you run when you do your parameter fits? What what do you get as your estimated uh, duration of, uh, of uh, resistance after infection. This, this is, uh, you mean the, uh, this, this uh, R, the R compartment? Well, so I'm looking, you have R, right, you recovered. Yeah, but R is, yeah, R is not resistant, is they recovered. Uh, right. Okay. But they're, but they're not susceptible. So they return they not to susceptible. susceptible at a rate omega. And I'm wondering what, what your estimate of the duration of uh, immunity is based on your model. Okay. Uh, uh, Adrián, would you like to answer this? Okay. But uh, we consider, uh, we, we, fix, we fixed uh, some parameter values. Uh, we, uh, around all parameters of this model, we only estimate two parameters, uh, beta and alpha. Uh, omega is fixed and we consider an immunity period of Half a year. Uh, we talk uh, with this, this uh, uh, a value, but we can consider other uh, other periods. Uh, we now shoot for other values. Um, but you, so you haven't systematically explored the effect of of that of that of moving from six months to nine months or four yeah. months. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 we have floated uh, about it, but uh, we observed uh, the natural behavior is the, the epidemic, the, uh, the, the maximum value of the incidence or prevalence is a more uh, move to the left, to the right. No, for uh, we, we, we delayed more time in reach the maximum value of prevalence. But uh, this is, uh, is, is uh, there are really, uh, really difference in these values, but uh, we prove, start our simulation with this value. Other questions? I can keep going. So you talked about using the models in, in, in public policy to try to define when schools would reopen. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you worked with the, the government of Mexico City and Sonora? How did that collaboration come about? How did it go? Well, how did, that, how did it affect policy? Right, well, that's a good question. Difficult. Uh, we were most successful with Querétaro. With Querétaro, we were approached by the not by the Secretary of Health, but by the Secretary of Education, because he was in charge of the reopening of schools. And fortunately, he's a scientifically trained uh, secretary. He's an engineer uh, specialist in control theory. 
So he, he dedicated himself to the administration of uh, uh, schools and especially technological universities, but we, he got into this uh, post and he uh, has this mentality and with these ideas, he, he uh, uh, asked us to give a presentation first to ca calculate uh, in Mexico use this traffic light semaphore, we call it in Spanish, this traffic light of green, yellow, and red, depending on certain indicators. And uh, the problem is that the use of the, this traffic light in Mexico has been very controversial because the federal government has changed the meaning of the different lights without much um, uh, justification, just by practical purposes, depending on how the epidemic goes. And that created a lot of uh, skepticism in the overall society about the meaning of this of the traffic light. We were working with our models using this total incidence, not, not only the, the traffic light is based essentially on the reported cases, reported deaths, and things that can be counted and observed. And our model is using the data to project and estimate the total number of cases. And that uh, goes to him curiosity. And he approached us. We were we have a dashboard and a site in the National University where we publish these estimations. And he liked the, um, the, in the risk index of this uh, Joshua Bites. It, it is very intuitive. It is interpretable. And the people can really grasp the meaning of going to a certain place with so many people and getting the risk of finding one in, in sick there. And with this thing, together with uh, statistics on how the Querétaro uh, epidemic goes, they designed a web, website in which they put this information. It is very clearly explained in terms for the, for the normal people, not technicism. It says uh, what is the level of risk calculated with the model uh, and the risk index. They, they indicate which municipality have what risk, what does it mean, the interpretation of that, what are the measures that have to be taken by the population, and they, by the side, are keeping um, a statistic of the number of cases in the schools and how many classrooms have been closed or how many schools have been closed. And with this, they put together with this information, every week they put the schools that did a good job and the schools that may need to reinforce their, their uh, strategy for controlling the epidemic. And we've been opening, the, the schools opened on uh, August 30th. And up to now, we are winning. The, no, I mean, it's working. We have a lot of detractors, uh, but uh, the models are working. And it's particularly most important than the models is the politicians that are putting together the strategy in which the indices are used, are doing a very good job on communicating the ideas to the general population of integrating their teams to understand the indices and putting their own indices and explanations for the people. I have given talks to the uh, principals of the schools of Querétaro, more than 500, I think it was uh, middle, high school and the previous one, I don't remember in English how to call it, but uh, from 12 years to 18, something like that. And for the principals of those schools, explaining this, this, uh, these indices and how they are interpreted and what does it mean to, why the epidemic group goes up, why it goes down, and all these explanations in a very, very simple terms. And it's been working. In the Mexico City, the, uh, the epidemic was in charge in the beginning on the secretary of, science of the Mexico City. And she is also a scientist, a biologist, but uh, we, don't, we didn't have quite the, the, the communication and they have their own development for doing things. And the federal government was a very, very complicated thing. So we, we communicate with them, we give our models, we discuss with them, but we don't have a official participation in that sense. I mean, John, I think, I talk, I explained to John the, the situation we had in Mexico in terms of perception of scientific uh, work and scientific standards uh, for the management of the epidemic. 
And that was a problem with, because as we have heard in some talks in, uh, here, uh, the political use of the models and they, using them as the incarnations of truth brought about very negative uh, uh, feedback when reality hit. So we have that problem. Uh, but in terms of the Querétaro, we have a small success and we are very happy. Unfortunately, the government changes in the state government changes on October 1st. So probably our, our indices will disappear together with the old administration, but that is life. And in terms of Sonora, I think uh, uh, it was something similar in the beginning was, uh, I, I think Adrian can tell us better about it, but it also was an ephemeral uh, collaboration, I think. Okay, other questions? I mean, I can ask one more question to round out the hour because I thought it was fascinating, which is, I mean, uh, South, Central and South America have had bad epidemics in terms of, of incidents and, and death rates. Are, are there lessons from Mexico that oh. could be applied in Colombia, Peru, uh, and other, are, is there something, are there, are there social organizations or political issues that would be similar that would allow this particular approach to be valuable in, in other places? Well, uh, I think each country has, and there is not much, more, much communications among our countries. That's unfortunate. Uh, we, because Adrian, Adrian is uh, from Peru, He's working in Mexico, but he's from Peru. And we got involved with uh, an um, um, a datathon, they call it, a kind of workshop for looking at the epidemic data and uh, organized by the government of Peru. We participated in it with these indices, trying to do that. We did that for the Peruvian, for the Peruvian uh, states. But uh, the emphasis there were uh, trying to get a dashboard that will uh, show the data as it is reported. They were not very interested in projections or risk indices, but rather on showing the describing the epidemics in a uh, data visualizing visualization format. Uh, I don't know. I really I'm not in contact with the health departments of any of those places. It's through the uh, researchers, and I dare say that at least in my from my perspective and knowledge, the uh, communication between scientists working in these areas uh, on regarding the epidemic is limited. It's mainly uh, limited to academic um, meetings. I have given, given many talks in Colombia, in Chile, in Brazil, in many, many places, but it's academic. There is no link to the other side there. And here it was very difficult. It was. Uh, not was it wasn't easy to to go. I mean, we started working with the state of Querétaro uh, probably in March, but we've been working in the epidemic since March last year, and it took like one year to to convince few very few people and only one in terms of effective usage of our results to to make a team. But we did it, and it was this combination of uh, situations. And uh, that's a reality of uh, Central America and Mexico in this moment. And from my point of view, of course, an experience. I didn't mean to say that, that, that this every, every country has, and every region has <laughs> its own special issues. Uh, but, but I thought perhaps your comment about the, the, the presence of these very large public events might be something that was shared by uh, yeah. more of the, the, the problem that we have, uh, James, is that um, in the mitigation measures are very limited. Here, people, it's uh, has a very low economic, eco economic um, standard. Uh, they have to work in the streets and uh, low level of uh, score. Uh, is, uh, education and all these things mix in terms that people is in the streets and it's very difficult to keep them out. 
I mean, I guess I was wondering because I uh, years ago used to visit in, in Bogota quite a bit. And the, the city government in Bogota was very interested in science-based methods to improve uh, public health and safety. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if that's still the case because the government's changed, as you say. Yeah. But, uh, it's, it's, I guess, as you say, the victories are small, but it's important if you can, if you can get one yeah. state to, to respond, that's impressive. Yeah. And we are hoping that after our intervention, we will keep our good, a good perspective, I mean, a good opinion from those guys, because in the beginning, uh, the guys that participated in the model in Mexico uh, are, are, I mean, very hard time for them. I mean, they have no, no credibility. And that is the problem. We, we need to protect our work and to, to see how we can manage failures and successes and both of them to contribute to a good appreciation of what science can do in good terms, in the positive terms. And so we are trying to keep that good opinion because that will allow us probably to continue informing the government or uh, participate in some preventions. We would like to start planning for the next pandemic because it will come and uh, we should be there, I guess. Okay, I know you had to leave at four. Yes. So I wanted to thank you very much for this very stimulating talk. Thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, I will edit out the Zoom bomb and the recording. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so you'll have a clean recording of this. And I look forward, we have a meeting tomorrow. Is that right, uh, Bruce and Reinhardt for steering committee? Mm, no, I don't think so. No? Okay, then I'm no, the steering committee met last Friday, and the, the our uh, subgroup is uh, postponed for another two weeks. Okay, great. Okay, so no meeting tomorrow. Thank you, thank you everybody for uh, joining you. us. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for a very stimulating talk, and I'll see you next week. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you very much. Bye.